let me zoom in. And we should be good. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Good evening. And uh, we'll go ahead and pray it in and get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ability to gather today. Uh, you know, we pray for those who aren't able to make it today. Pray for those who are here and online. And Lord, we just invite you in. We invite you here so that your words come out and not mine so that people can learn about the dangerous ground within our minds, within our hearts, and that we learn how to eliminate it, Lord. And so, Lord, we invite you here. We ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so welcome to a new series for the Upper Room Youth Group entitled Dangerous Ground. Over the course of the next several weeks, we will be going over some of the dangerous ground in our hearts and in our minds in order to identify any issues that might be going on in our individual walks with God. This is going to be a very, very impactful series. So if you know anyone who you'd want to invite to the Upper Room Youth Group, now is the time. Also, please do not forget that this Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we will be heading to our first Upper Room Youth Group field trip. Woo! Bible Museum in D.C. Uh, I do have your permission form. Please don't go before you grab it. Do I so, have Yes, you do. So, also, after the Bible Museum, we are going to have a worship night. It's going to be fantastic. Everyone's going to be singing. It's going to be great. And uh, I believe we're inviting musicians, too. And then mark your calendars, mark your notes, November 3rd and 4th. Uh, we're going to have a youth convention. It's going to actually be in Woodbridge. So workshops, worship, uh, food. It's, you know, an overnight stay. So, you know, there'll be a hotel. There'll be... Uh, I believe so. I can double check for you, though. Probably won't be there, but that's fine. Uh, what? No, it's it's. I think it's two days. There will be a pretty good uh, Christian band there called Fearless BND. Uh, they're actually really good. Chris and I have listened to it. But yeah, November third and fourth. Look at your calendars. Mark your calendars. But. Getting back to dangerous ground. There are several things that can be identified as dangerous ground within our lives. But what we're going to be addressing is the dangerous ground that is within us. The places where we walk with God, it's a little bit unsure in our step in those places. Because when you walk in places that are dangerous ground, you can trip. You can fall. You can hurt yourself. If anyone's ever been hiking before, you know this stuff can happen. When you're an inexperienced hiker, you trip, you fall, you hurt yourself. So it's important for us to be able to identify these trouble areas in order to deal with them. So the dangerous places of the mind, I could really think, fall into three different categories. First one's faulty theology. Faulty theology. Who here knows what that means? Something that someone says happened in the Bible, but it didn't. Yeah, that could be faulty theology. Aiden, go ahead. Like, does it have to be about the Bible? Yeah, or about your beliefs. Like, like, for instance, a fault theology is a fallen angel belief or a fixed God belief. Okay, Ariamas? What? Um... In November? Uh, youth convention. Okay. Yeah, that's a great definition. Believing in something that is false. Faulty theology, it's a belief or a system that you believe that is not scriptural. 
whether that's due to a lack of understanding or knowledge of the Bible, or just how you were brought up, or what you personally believe, it doesn't matter how you get faulty theology, all of that can result in faulty theology. It's hard enough for people to understand that we serve one God in three persons. People have plenty of questions about that. People have debated about how that works for thousands of years. But people like to debate on other points of our faith too. If you have faulty theology, that is dangerous ground to stand on. So it's important for us as we go through life to continue diving into an understanding of what Scripture tells us. Because... Thank you, that's off. I really don't like it when it's on. Because the bottom line is, is that when the scripture or our opinions, our opinion of scripture, you know, one, one has to take precedence. Our opinion of scripture or scripture. If your opinion of scripture is higher than scripture, that can result in faulty theology. But if Scripture holds more importance than your opinion. You mold your opinion to Scripture. That's a little bit better of a way. Make sense? So, when you have faulty theology, or when your heart isn't right with God, that can lead to different type of dangerous ground. The second type of dangerous ground is double-mindedness. Believing in one thing at one time, and then later on in the day, week, month, year, believing in something else that is the opposite of what you believed in the first place. Confusion. Yeah. And then you just go back and forth. That is double-mindedness. And it's a critical problem that you see nowadays all the time. Take a look at our high schools. We just got back to school, right? And I am sure there are some people in public school who believe that they can bark or meow at people in the hallways and that they're sometimes animals. They act and sound as much. They think they're animals. But later on in the day, when they realize they have opposable thumbs and they hold their knives or forks or pens or pencils, when they're given an assignment, they have to write their name down, they recognize, oh no, wait, I'm a person. That's double-mindedness. But that's a very, very extreme case. Aiden? Aiden? Who's pastor here? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, probably more relatable case of double-mindedness could be hygiene. When I grew up, and the way I was raised, before breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you washed your hands. Because the Lord knows what was on those hands. Especially if you were playing outside. And so I was repeatedly told, wash your hands before you eat. But if I come in and I'm hungry and I want to try and sneak past the bathroom in order to eat, I would sometimes try it, even though I knew the rule. More often than not, I was caught, I felt guilty enough, the rule resonated with me, that I just you know, became second neighbor, nature. Wash my hands before I eat. But before that, I had double-mindedness. I wanted to eat, but I knew the rule and I just didn't care about it as much. Sometimes I followed the rule, sometimes I didn't. But when we struggle with faulty theology, and we struggle with double-mindedness, there is a third thing that we can struggle against. And this dangerous ground is a little bit harder to deal with than just breaking a household rule, or resolving an issue we have or don't know about with our theology. For the kids who play games or read books, I want you to think of this dangerous ground like an enemy castle. The twist is is that the enemy castle is a stronghold in your mind. It's just like our group activity. For those of you who weren't here online, we wish you were. We stacked up chairs and then threw huge, giant, bouncy balls at these chairs to try to destroy those strongholds. And it was surprisingly tough. There was a lot of misses. But there were some hits. Girls won more than boys, just saying. Hey, Actually, it, was a tie. it was a tie? Okay, fair enough. All right, so, but anyway, this dangerous ground is the enemy's territory within your mind that they have claimed and built a fortress around, a stronghold in your mind. And so over the course of this series, we are going to just, just like our activity, we're going to destroy some enemy castles. 
should be fairly exciting. And the reason that these are strongholds is because over the course of the years, whether it be you or the enemy's influence or both, these strongholds within your mind have been built out of assumptions, behaviors, habits, tendencies, observations, emotions, and they are all not what God wants you to have. Why do we define these things as strongholds? Because Scripture does. And so here comes our first scripture of the day. Who wants to read it? You got it. Second Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. So hey, we've got weapons, right? They're divine weapons. Not weapons that we can hold in our hands like those giant bouncy balls, but divine power to destroy strongholds. And where are the strongholds? They're in our minds. They're within us. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Speaking about stronghold, speaking about obeying Christ, I want you to think of God as our king. Because he is. Jesus is our king. We are part of his kingdom. We are subject to his kingly rule. But to take this analogy further and give it some weight, even though you are a part of God's kingdom, there are rebels in the kingdom who want to destroy the kingdom from within. They can't do it because God's all-powerful. He's already written the ending. Yay, we, we win! Woo! But that doesn't stop us from being tasked with destroying the enemy's castles. So if you want to serve your king more efficiently, you want to advance his kingdom, which he's called you to do, you got some enemy strongholds you got to destroy. But wait, Mr. Max! We serve God out of love! Shouldn't God just love everybody and everything? There's your faulty theology again. Because yes, God is a God of love. But he also hates things. If you love your family, you would hate for something bad to happen to them, right? So yes, God hates things. And he spells out for us in Proverbs what he hates. Who wants to take this one? Come on, Aiden. Haughty eyes. Devices. Six, sixteen through nineteen. Good job. So King Solomon wrote Proverbs when he was following the Lord. And it's in Proverbs 6, through 16, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, that we see what God hates. These are all things that God hates. And they all arrive, derive from heart issues. What's up, Ken? Okay. Uh, no, we know that Proverbs was predominantly done with Solomon. No, uh, Psalms, that's David. Most of them were David. So, all these have, you know, pretty much stem from heart issues. And if you won't have a heart issue, if you have any er enemy territory within you. I've personally dealt with these people. Like today, online. Some Facebook trolls. But, yeah. Ones who sow discord among brothers... I'm sure you don't want to be among those people. It's sad. People who call themselves Christians, they still do this. And our mission is to get to know God every single day. And we've got to know what our God doesn't like if we want to get to know Him. 
And God doesn't like the things that result from having any strongholds within you. And if this is the result, strongholds of the mind are the cause. God wants you to eliminate this dangerous ground within you because if you don't, no, if you don't, these things might happen later down the road. So, Max, how do we eliminate these strongholds? This is going to be the model that we use over the course of these weeks as we address enemy strongholds, lay siege to them, and destroy them. First thing we need to do is identify the stronghold. Oh, that, I did not enlarge that. It says identify them within us. Sorry about that. So, identify the stronghold. And if it was easy to do, then everyone would be doing it, right? It's easy to point out strongholds in others, but not so easy when it's in ourselves. Jesus even calls out this behavior in us for saying, You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7, 5. A lot of us have siblings. And if you don't have siblings, you can use this in I think here has siblings. It's hard to admit when you're the one who's doing it wrong, but it's easy to admit, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so is messing up. Right? That's, that's why this first step is such a big issue for a lot of people. Because as much as we want to just identify other people's problems, we don't want to look at ourselves sometimes. That's exactly what we're going to be doing. Is looking at ourselves and our behavior, identifying those enemy castles so we can destroy them. And not just us. Like, we can't do this by ourselves. We gotta ask God to help us. Help us destroy these strongholds. God is the one who has power and authority over the enemy. How much power and authority does he have? All power and authority, right? That's when we covered deliverance uh, miracles recently. It's not by our own power that we're able to cast out demons. So, everyone remembers what happened to the seven sons of Sceva? Remember what happened? So they tried to cast out demons in Jesus' name. Did they know Jesus? No. So what happened? They were roughed up. They were beat up. And tossed out. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus that we can cast out demons. And you can't use his name if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. He's the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been given unto him. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. And so if we have that relationship with Jesus and we use that authority, we can destroy those strongholds and change those behaviors that God doesn't want in our lives. Because as we've learned, there's things God hates. I don't want God to hate something in me. I don't want God to be disappointed in what I've done in my life with the freedom that he's given me. Just as I'm sure you don't want God to be disappointed in you. That feeling stinks. When somebody's disappointed in you and you know it, it's not fun. And at the end of our lives, right before we take our last breath, we see G well, right after we take our last breath, we see Jesus. And he's going to say either one of two things. He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, if you don't have a relationship with him. Or, he's going to say, well done, our good and my good and faithful servant. And so, if we improve in our walk with Jesus, and destroy these strongholds, I can almost assure you that he's going to say, well done. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't twist my words. Online, don't give me any nasty emails. We're not going to solve everything over these next few weeks, which is why this last step is probably the most important. And that is to repeat these previous steps as many times as necessary over the course of your life. This is our walk with God. We do the self-evaluation over and over and over again in order to better ourselves, in order to serve Him better. That is the goal. Because we don't get everything right right now, that's okay. Because why? His mercies are new every morning. He is faithful to you. 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. If we don't get everything right in this series and we're not perfect, that's okay. We're human. But whenever we encounter a problem or a stronghold in ourselves, we repeat these steps, keep on moving. Because His mercies are new every morning. So, how do we identify the strongholds that we want to destroy within us? What are the things that we're going to address specifically in this series? Today is an overview of all of them. But, we are going to cover the seven deadly sins. That's right. Pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and slothfulness. Seven vices. And really, from these sins, stem easily into the seven things that God hates. If God hates those seven things and they are an abomination to him, and they are the actions of somebody that's doing these right here. So, again, over the course of the next several weeks, we're hopefully going to be eliminating these from ourselves if we have them. But Max, wait! The seven deadly sins! They aren't a biblical concept, are they? Are they? I'm hearing yeses. Who thinks yes? Who thinks no, they're not biblical? You're all wrong. You won't find the seven deadly sins in the Bible. But since the time of Jesus, this list has been around in some form or another. Whoa. Oh, yeah. A very famous Roman historian, Quintus Horatius Flockers. Flaccus, sorry, Flaccus. He is what? That's Greek. How am I reading that? Very carefully. He is credited with creating the original idea of nine different vices, nine things that we can do wrong. And through all of his writings, go ahead. Well, they chiseled a lot of things into clay and marble, so they had to make sure they had straight lines. And They didn't have access to a lot of papyrus back then, or what? I don't know. What's up? I could go back. There you go. Alright, so, originally this Roman historian created these nine things that we do wrong. And through all of his writings, it grew in popularity, and he lived just before Jesus was born. On this earth. Now, 350 years roll by, and this list of vices are compounded now with the idea of the gospel. And so, in the fourth century, a monk named Evagrius Ponticus, a monk, took these nine vices and he combined them into eight. Are you are you ready to go yet? Or no? okay. Is it a Christian monk or no? Catholic. And while this, list, uh, while this list keeps growing more and more in popularity, because, you know, because it's talking about vices that we deal with as Christians. Do you need me to go back one more time? All right. So, Christianity is growing. These vices are gaining popularity, and this list is growing. Christianity is growing across Asia, Af you know, Europe, Africa. And this list is giving people an idea of things to struggle that you know we struggle against. Things in order to, to get rid of in order to better yourselves. And this, go ahead. So, gastromargia is gluttony. Is the eighth one fornication? No, the eighth one is hyperrephania, which is pride. Fornication is number two. The Greek word for fornication is pornea. This is where you get pornography. Fornication. So, 
With that said, in AD 590, this list grew into such popularity that the Pope himself took this list and condensed it into what, the, what we really know today as the seven deadly sins. And more than that, he gave us seven virtues as well. Virtues to strive for. Because it's easy to say that you're against something like the seven deadly sins, but it's easier to do that when you're standing for something. When you're striving towards a goal. Otherwise, if you just stand against something with no goal, you're just a hater. So these seven sins have their opposites that we are to strive for. And so, with that said... Humility instead of pride. This is the Latin. That was Greek beforehand. This is the Latin. So, chastity instead of lust. Temperance instead of gluttony. Charity instead of greed. Diligence instead of slothfulness. Kindness instead of envy. Patience instead of wrath. Now, we're going to be going over these a little bit more in depth, but as these are strongholds, these are strongholds that we have to fight against and identify, and we're asking God to help us destroy, we're going to shift from, whoop, we're going to shift from those, hopefully over to here, and repeat as necessary as they crop up. In fact, we want to strive towards these virtues as we're destroying these strongholds because something's got to take the place of that territory. If you destroy an enemy castle and it's all just rubble there, do you take over the territory or do you just leave it there? If you just leave it there, somebody else is going to come back. And that's scriptural too. Because if you exercise one demon and you don't fill that void, they're going to find a house swept clean and seven more will come back. Worse than before. So we're destroying these territory, this territory because something's got to give. Something's got to be put over this dangerous ground. So why not virtues? Why not the Holy Spirit? In fact, these virtues kind of look familiar. Does anyone know what these virtues remind us of that is in Scripture? No? Fruit of the Spirit. As you can see, these virtues in a biblical form are in Galatians. Does anyone want to read this? Amen. So, Paul was writing to the Galatians, saying here that if you do all these things, you have these in your personality, you have the fruit of the Spirit. And if we're going to put labels on things, I would much rather you have the fruit of the Spirit than the seven virtues. But, the seven virtues are what you need in order to get the motor going, so be it. Now again, as we're going through these sins that are dangerous ground, we're self-evaluating, we're digging all the bad stuff out, so we've got to put good stuff in its place. And hopefully by the end, we're all better people for it. But I want to caution everyone about dangerous theology. Remember, that's another type of dangerous ground. If you call yourself a Christian, believe on the Lord Jesus, that he died for your sins and rose from the grave three days later, and that now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and that he is the only way to heaven, you are good. You are a Christian. And through this exercise, destroying these strongholds, that's not how you become a Christian. That's dangerous theology. But we're doing this so that we can better serve Jesus Christ. We're doing this because he's our king, and he told us to do something. Let's take territory for the kingdom. Which means what? Destroying enemy strongholds. The added benefit of doing this is that we just become better people. 
kind of nicer to be around. And that's why we're better able to serve our Lord and King. This last slide here is going to be our memory verses for the series. I want you to make a conscious effort to remember these verses, jotting them down, going over them at least once a day. What's up? Are there prizes for say? You get to be a better person. That's the prize. Good job. <laughs> Are there prizes? I want you to make a conscious effort to remember these. Because these three verses are really the key to the process of what we're doing. And the first one is this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.8 1 John 1 verse 8 This is where we're starting. And that's the fact is, is that we're not all perfect. We all have sin. We do have some of those deadly sins going on. It's okay. If you think you don't have any deadly sins going on in your life, you probably have pride. Bless you. So we all have something that we have to deal with. If you haven't addressed it, we have an enemy stronghold somewhere. And that's okay. Because you are just like everyone else in the face of the planet. Because why? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says this here to his letter to the Romans. We all fall short. We all have sinned. We all have problems. But since we're Christians, we know we have a problem. and We know we have to deal with these enemy strongholds. So, we need to deal with this problem. How do we deal with this problem? Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That might just be, um, you may be just hearing what Jesus said. Um, the will of God, what is the good and acceptable. See, you, you almost know some of this list already. And that's Romans 12, too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. What is good, acceptable, and perfect. The world would like nothing more than for you to not only keep your enemy strongholds there, but celebrate them. Accept them as a part of you. The world wants you to conform to it. Wants you to celebrate your sin, because this is a sinful world, right? Not all of the world. Not all of the world. Yeah. But God calls us to be transformed, what? By the renewing of our mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't celebrate your sin. Destroy it. Lay siege to it. Get it out of there. And then fill that void with some good stuff. The fruit of the Spirit. You know what? If they say bad is funner, they're probably right. Whoa, whoa. They're probably right in the very, very short term. However, that will lead to remorse, that will lead to conviction. And then ultimately, that will lead to eternal damnation. Not so fun in the long term. So, we have everything that we need. We know we have a problem. We know there is a solution to that problem. We have a way to test and discern what is the will of God through what? The scriptures. And Scripture has told us what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have everything we need. The only thing we don't need are those enemy strongholds. Which we have, but not for long. Because over the next several weeks, we're going to be conquering some dangerous ground. Preferably not the ones who have spoken this entire time. 
Yeah, I know, right? You. <laughs> Who wants to pray us out? Anyone? All right, I'll do it. No! Free will, Dad. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this message and this brief overview. Lord, I ask that you guide us and guide our steps in our self-evaluation. Help us to destroy some enemy strongholds within us, Lord, so that we may become better servants toward you that we can better follow you and your way so we can rejoice and be glad and not desire what is sinful and wrong and what you hate. We thank you, Lord, for giving us direction in your word. We thank you, Jesus, for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.